Hi everyone, thanks for joining. We're gonna get started now. Today we have approximately 45 minutes and one question, one follow-up. We have Dr. Williams and Dr. Brown here today, so I'll turn it over to them to get started. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, Thursday, uh, we give a report of what's happened over the last number of days since we talked to you on Monday. And uh, it's been two weeks, and so we're having an update from Dr. Brown and the science table on modeling and how the analytics of how we are doing and what's going on and especially with the issues around we've highlighted in the last few weeks with Dr. Allen around variants of concern um, in that and so we're looking forward to hearing that. So I'm going to have some numbers afterwards but for now I'm going to hand things over to Dr. Brown to give us an update on the data and modeling and analytics. So thank you Dr. Brown for being here today. Great, thank you. Uh, before I start I want to acknowledge that today is the International Day of Women and Girls in Science, and I want to thank the women on the provincial advisory tables and the many women scientists contributing their work for the scientific insight and the expertise that they bring to the challenges of COVID-19 in Ontario. The data I'll present today tells two stories. Uh, one story is the real success we have had with our current public health measures. This has come from the sacrifices we've made, mobility is down, and with it, cases and hospitalizations for COVID-19. The other story is about a real threat. The new variants of concern that spread so much more easily are here and they threaten to undo our progress. These two stories, one about success and one about threat, are not competing stories. The work behind these stories that I'll share today is the product of dozens of scientists studying COVID-19 in Ontario and all of whom come to the same conclusions. Let me start with the first story. COVID cases are down, test positivity rates are down, hospitalizations are down, and deaths in long-term care are down. None of this happens by chance. The public health measures that started in December have worked, and the exceedingly hard sacrifices you made to stay home, to shut a business, to limit your contacts, have bent the curve back downwards. The decision to prioritize long-term care homes for the vaccination, however challenging, has worked and has saved lives. The single largest portion of deaths arise in long-term care homes and daily deaths in these homes are declining. If we continue to prioritize vaccinations towards those who are most affected by the pandemic, whether in retirement homes, in shelters, among older Ontarians, or in our hardest hit neighborhoods and communities, we will continue to save lives. But the second story tells us about the threat that can undermine our success. The B117 variant, first identified in the United Kingdom, is spreading throughout Ontario. It spreads between people much faster than the current variant, and there's some evidence that it may also be more lethal. If the B117 variant behaves as it did in the United Kingdom, cases will start to grow here again in late February or early March. That is, unless we can limit the spread through public health measures. The UK example is important. In a matter of months, the B117 variant went from detection to the dominant strain. And as it became the dominant strain, cases more than tripled in a month. At the same time, their healthcare system strained with nurses forced to care for four to eight times as many patients as usual. And there were daily deaths regularly in excess of a thousand people. The threat posed by the B117 variant will only increase if other new variants, like those identified in Brazil, and South Africa spread throughout Ontario. Now we can respond to this threat. We've shown that we can turn the curve and we've done it twice now in Ontario. The same public health measures that work against the old variant work against the new variant. And the vaccines are good news. From what we can tell so far, the vaccines we are using in Ontario today work against these new variants. But there's little room for error in our response to this threat. ICU beds are not opening up at the same rate while the vaccine is saving lives in long-term care homes, far fewer ICU patients actually come from long-term care homes. So the vaccine campaign makes little difference uh, right now to our hospitals. The deficit between the care that Ontarians need in hospital and then what they're receiving continues to grow. And keeping schools open, which is critical for so many families, underlines the importance of controlling spread of the new variant in the community. Without the ability to respond quickly and effectively, without the ability to control spread in the community, we face the very real risk of a third wave and potentially a third lockdown. 
and the impact of this third wave will be as inequitable as the first two waves, with case and death rates highest in our racialized and lowest socioeconomic status neighborhoods. There will be little time to react quickly because of how fast the variants spread. We are, let me be clear, operating with uncertainty. That is the nature of a new disease with new variants. We need to do as much as we can to reduce that uncertainty. The best bet we can offer from the science is this. If we're able to push the impact of COVID-19 down further by sticking to public health measures and aggressive vaccination, we can avoid a third wave and hope for a late spring and summer that is much safer and more open. I want to finish by acknowledging the challenges the pandemic poses to mental health. Every survey we read today, regardless of where uh, the outlet it's coming from, points out high levels of stress, distress, and anxiety, often incredibly elevated in the people working hardest in our healthcare system. Some of the important measures of mental health that we could look at do show little change. Ontarians are resilient. Others, such as the continuing increases in deaths from opioids, or rising eating order admission, disorder admissions, show how the pandemic is hitting communities hard within our province. This pattern is not unique to Ontario. It's been repeated in many jurisdictions, including the U.S. And it's easy to understand why the pandemic has affected the mental health of some Ontarians so profoundly. At this stage of the pandemic, with new risks looming, it is easy to lose hope. But the evidence and our experience in Ontario gives me real hope that we can avoid the crisis that other parts of the world have faced. We do the right things now, we can move into a late spring and summer that is much safer uh, and more open. Uh, and now as we move to the slides, uh, my apologies, but we will lose for uh, the duration of the presentation uh, the sign language translation. Uh, if we could put the slides up, please. Great. Thank you. And as usual, I'll start with the key findings. So as I said, public health measures are paying off in declining mobility, cases, positivity and hospitalizations. Focusing vaccination on long-term care homes is paying off with declining daily deaths. But ICU occupancy is flat and the access to care deficit continues to grow. The B117 variant of concern is spreading in Ontario and cases will likely grow again in late February with ICU admissions increasing afterwards. Aggressive vaccination and sticking with the stay-at-home order will help avoid a third wave, a third lockdown. Some key mental health indicators are unchanged. However, critical and important measures such as emergency department admissions, opioid deaths, and care for eating disorders are worsening. Let me start with the first slide on mobility. If you look here, uh, you can see mobility across uh, a number of provinces. Ontario is the lowest line here in the blue. And you can see following the public health restrictions that started late in December in the stay-at-home order, you see a break in the return to pre uh, holiday uh, mobility, and you see it relatively flat there. That lower mobility is what has actually helped reduce cases by reducing the contacts. And you can see how that lower mobility traces into lower total cases. They are still high in some of our public health units, uh, but you can see overall cases have come down uh, for Ontario uh, with uh, 69 uh, weekly cases right here uh, reported uh, per 100,000 residents. Uh, but you can also see it coming down in virtually every public health unit. This pattern is repeated when we look at percent positivity. Uh, you can see still that it is high in some communities, uh, but overall it's come down and it's come down in virtually uh, every community uh, over the last little while. This pattern is consistent across age groups. As you can see here, uh, looking at uh, different age deciles or 10-year age groupings, cases have come down. Uh, that's the top panel. They've come down the greatest degree in uh, older Ontarians, which is an important uh, move and, uh, and good news. Uh, tests have come down slightly, uh, but not enough to make us concerned about the drop in cases. And percent positivity has also come down substantially. Uh, in this case, uh, greatest among uh, younger Ontarians. Vaccine administration continues. Uh, we're now over 425,000 doses. And this is important when we consider uh, the focus on long-term care and in this slide, the focus that we see on uh, deaths. And so the orange part of each bar reflects the deaths that have occurred in long-term care. Uh, the gray and black parts uh, represent deaths outside of long-term care in Ontario in the first wave uh, and the second wave. And you can see here, particularly in the first wave, but very strongly in the second wave as well, 
that the majority of deaths have occurred in long-term care homes. That's why the vaccination and prioritizing long-term care homes for vaccination has been so important as it helps prevent deaths. Uh, there is data coming in from some of the uh, public health units that we're starting to see uh, higher death rates in the community. Uh, again, though, this is in older Ontarians and uh, reflects the importance of prioritizing vaccinations to where they can do the, uh, give the greatest benefit. We go here, you can see again the translation of the vaccination uh, into uh, important sort of key indicators in long-term care. Uh, we show this slide virtually every briefing. Uh, the orange line is the daily active cases in residents, and as you can see here, it has declined significantly as vaccinations have uh, increased across long-term care homes. Uh, the yellow line is daily active cases in staff, and you can see that's come down well as well. And the green line, which is the cumulative deaths, is starting to flatten out and plateau there at the top. Uh, were I to uh, share with you the data or have on this uh, chart the data that we received this morning, we have actually now only 194 long-term care homes in outbreak, and unfortunately we have had 925 residents die uh, since the beginning of the, uh, of the year on January 1st. What this means, though, is that we are now essentially equivalent uh, in terms of the number of deaths uh, in the second wave uh, that we saw in the first wave, and the deaths in the second wave in long-term care will continue. So we will exceed uh, the number of deaths in the first wave in this current wave. You can see here the decline in cases translating into a decline in hospitalizations. Uh, the orange bars on this chart uh, reflect the change uh, in hosp uh, hospital inpatients uh, with COVID-19 over time, starting back at the beginning of August and completing on the uh, uh, close to where we are today. You can see that it's come down uh, quite substantially over the last uh, few weeks, which is positive. Uh, but you can see as well those red bars, which is ICU uh, patients, has not uh, changed substantially. And so uh, ICUs is flat, and this represents still a significant strain on the system. So mobility is down, cases are down, hospitalizations are down, positivity is down. Uh, this is good news. The challenge is the growth of the new variants. Uh, these new variants, particularly B117, are likely between 5 and 10% of cases right now in the province. Uh, that's up substantially from what we would have seen at the beginning of last month. Uh, and it's important to keep in mind that these variants transmit much more easily. So wherever you are with your R or your reproduction number for the current variants, you need to have a much lower R overall to really stop the transmission of these, uh, of these variants in the tracks. Uh, the panel on the, uh, on the right-hand side may actually provide a good visual illustration of that. So the top curve is the total number of cases. And as you can see right now, uh, that next curve down that says non-VOC, that's the current variant of the virus, those cases are declining, and we see that in our data, and that's driving the current decrease in cases. But as the, current, uh, as the variant of concern spreads and becomes the dominant strain of the virus, you will see it actually start to drive up more cases because it is that much more transmissible. And at some point, uh, the old variant and the new variant curves cross, and that starts to drive increasing cases. Uh, we're thinking that this increase of cases will likely be uh, sometime in late February or early in March. Uh, work that I saw from the Fields Institute of Mathematics this morning uh, shows that the uh, decrease in our cases appears to be slowing uh, using some of their advanced modeling and that likely we will see the turnaround soon. Now, according to the estimates we have, we would need to have a reproduction number uh, of around 0.7. Uh, to be able to control the uh, cases, and I'll show some charts on that in a second. I think it's important to note that uh, our current uh, reproduction number is not uh, 0.7, uh, and that we've only really approached uh, 0.7 in very rare intervals uh, in this uh, pandemic. Uh, important to note, as I've said, that the public health measures that we have in place uh, are effective against all variants. Uh, and important to note as well that the uh, two new uh, variants, uh, the B1351, which was first detected in South Africa, and P1, uh, which was first detected in Brazil, uh, have also been detected in Ontario. And these are, again, highly transmissible variants with some risk that they uh, are vaccine escapees. Let me give an illustration of the importance of uh, how we keep the overall reproduction number down uh, using data from Toronto. On this chart, you can see uh, observed cases. That's the total cases. That's the top orange line. Uh, you can see the gray line that really follows for a great degree of time, that orange line. That is the old variant uh, cases. Uh, and if we keep the reproduction number down to 0.7, uh, 
uh, you can see that it also keeps that new variant suppressed, and that's the blue line there, uh, so that the total number of cases really uh, becomes flat here uh, in Toronto. But if the reproduction number is higher at 0.9, uh, in this chart, as you can see, it starts to drive a growth in cases despite declining uh, transmission of the old variant or the, uh, the one that we see uh, most commonly in Ontario right now. And so it's very critical that the control of the variant and the new cases is in place. Uh, you can't selectively control one or the other. Uh, you just need to keep the same measures in place to be able to control the uh, growth in the virus. Now, this is a, a series of models uh, looking at a best, uh, a worst, and sort of a uh, probably likely close to our current state case. Um, I'd like to focus just to talk, for instance, about what these uh, different estimates mean of cases. Uh, we're looking at different estimates around when we might relax public health measures, uh, either uh, soon or closer to the end of the month or beginning of March. We're trying to estimate the effect of when it is that uh, B117 actually arrived in Ontario uh, and looking at different estimates around its transmissibility, although Virtually every study confirms that it is uh, about 50% more transmissible. Uh, what you can see here is under the sort of uh, probably likely or most likely scenario, which is the middle orange line, we would expect uh, with a current uh, situation, we would have uh, between five and 6,000 cases uh, by the end uh, of March. This, uh, I think, importantly actually translates into a significant uh, burden on ICUs. And that's because the majority of ICU admissions actually arise outside of long-term care. And so if you contrast this chart with the one that we showed you on uh, deaths, you can see here that the orange bars, that's the ICU cases arising in long-term care homes, is actually only a small fraction of the total ICU admissions. Most of those admissions come in uh, in those sort of darker bars, which are uh, people living in the community. Uh, somewhere between uh, 40 and uh, 80 years old or, or older. Uh, and so uh, vaccination, although important and critical of focused on long-term care, uh, won't actually necessarily affect a significant amount of the long-term care or of the ICU admissions uh, in the province right now. Uh, and this translates uh, over the short run, uh, please recognize that these are short-run estimates that we present here, into, again, a significant growth in the number of ICU admissions uh, by the end of March, uh, with the uh, total uh, beds starting to creep up probably close again to 400 uh, in our most likely case. Uh, if we have the best case, uh, you will see that the ICU admissions actually do, or the ICU occupancy does actually drop below uh, 150 beds, uh, although it does start to curve up again and start to rise again uh, by the end of March. Uh, the worst case uh, scenario presents, again, a very significant risk uh, to IC, uh, ICU uh, functioning and hospital functioning with uh, close to 700 uh, beds occupied by COVID-19 patients. And I think it's important to note that even with a very finely tuned vaccination schedule uh, look at, and very optimistic vaccination numbers, uh, the difference between uh, opening and closing, the difference between kind of a uh, best case and a worst case scenario does translate into hundreds of ICU admissions. Uh, and it does translate into four to 500 more deaths uh, under different models. I think it's important to keep in mind, uh, while we look at this, this is not distributed across Ontario. Uh, equally, the regional pictures we show show this variation, and it's not distributed within our uh, communities in any equitable way. Uh, this is an estimate of the excess death uh, that we've seen since uh, the beginning of the COVID pandemic, uh, and this really reflects both um, excess death in, uh, from COVID-19 and uh, from other related causes or other causes. Uh, and you can see that the lowest estimates of excess death, although there is still excess death, more than we would expect to see, is in the highest income quintiles. Those are the dark lines at the bottom of the chart. And the highest uh, level of excess death uh, is in our poorest communities. Uh, and that's the lightest uh, colors at the top there. And this is uh, almost a twofold difference that uh, has uh, emerged in a relatively short period of time. Our estimates here only go to the middle of August. Now, important to note that virtually every survey that we see, every poll documents clearly uh, feelings of stress, distress, anxiety, uh, frustration, depression. Um, with the mental health measures that we're able to look at right now, some of these measures are stable, uh, reflecting the resilience of people. I'm showing you here dispensing of benzodiazepines, which is a common medication uh, for mental health. 
Uh, you can see it's roughly stable uh, over a number of years. That red dotted line indicates the uh, onset of the pandemic as declared by the World Health Organization. I could show you very similar charts for antipsychotics uh, or antidepressant uh, medications. However, there are other measures which are much more concerning and show challenges in people getting access to the care that they likely need. These are emergency department visits uh, for mental health uh, or substance uh, use uh, related concerns. And you can see a substantial drop in these emergency department visits with the onset of the pandemic. I think important to note here, this is not reflecting a drop in need, uh, knowing what we know about alcohol consumption, uh, substance use right now. Uh, we might expect actually to see a higher level of visits. Uh, so, so there is a problem with people getting to the care uh, that they need uh, with uh, obviously uh, serious consequences for their health. Uh, and you can see uh, even more significant uh, consequences for health here in the opioid uh, death rates here. It's important to know that this is a critical issue and it is a critical issue that did not start with the pandemic. Opioid uh, death rates have been rising for uh, a while but they have continued to rise through the pandemic. And you can see there that uh, red dotted line indicating the onset of the pandemic. Uh, the green bars are confirmed opioid deaths. Uh, the yellow are probable uh, and the blue is a suspect uh, drug related deaths. You can see that they continue uh, to climb uh, to quite high levels during the pandemic. And finally, this is uh, data that has been noted before, but this is eating disorder visits uh, and admissions to hospital for Ontarians uh, three years to 17 years of age. Uh, if you look at where the pandemic would have started, really kind of that uh, April or March or April uh, period of time, uh, you can see a substantial increase in the rate of admissions and the rate of hospital, uh, sorry, emergency department visits. Uh, the dotted line in each case indicates the average rate and it has climbed significantly for both of these measures. So just to finish off with the key findings, um, the public health measures are paying off right now in declining mobility, cases, positivity, and hospitalizations. This is not anything that happens by chance. Focusing vaccination on long-term care homes is paying off with declining daily deaths. ICU occupancy, however, is flat and the access to care deficit will continue to grow. Uh, the B117 variant of concern is spreading in Ontario and cases will likely grow again in late February uh, or early March with ICU admissions increasing afterwards. Aggressive vaccination and public health measures like a stay-at-home order will help avoid a third wave and a third lockdown, and we will have relatively little time to change course uh, if we need to. And although some key mental health indicators are changed, uh, other key measures are worsening. Uh, I'll just finish here with uh, a quick list of the scientists who've contributed to uh, the work presented uh, today. And uh, also here, just the uh, teams that have reviewed uh, the content uh, that was presented today. Uh, and with that, we can stop the uh, presentation and I will turn it over to uh, Dr. Williams again. Well, thank you, Dr. Brown. And as you can see, the, um, the projections, um, as Dr. Brown said, it's two messages. One is that our measures have and are working. We have the risk of the variance that has come on us. Uh, we started talking about more with you on this by mid-January. We've given you more updates as we've moved into these days here uh, with updates from our scientists and now we have some data that shows again the challenge that is ahead of us. But as Dr. Brown's alluded to, with public health measures and things we're asking people to do, uh, we can impact this and make a difference. Let's look at our numbers. Um, <clears throat> so our, over well, since the last time we talked, our seven day average of COVID-19 cases is 1,264. Today's number 945, um, while well, maybe encouraging, uh, we've had this before where we're having a, a data entry issue with mostly with Toronto as they shifted over to uh, the case contact management system in the province. And so uh, I would say, think that they're missing somewhere around uh, 203 cases today. So. Our number probably more today is around uh, the upper 1100s, maybe 1200 uh, in reality. But um, we've been staying around that 1000, 1100 for the last few days, and that's encouraging. Our trends <clears throat> in the time period for the period of this last one, the 29th of January to February the 4th, we're down to 1600, whereas the week before, the 22nd of January to the 28th, we were at 2128. That's a significant drop. 
Yeah, at the same time, our testing volumes have remained up. They're dipping a little bit, but not too bad as we're doing some other things there. So we went down to 28,303 on Monday, 30,798 on Tuesday. Testing volumes were back up to 52,504, and today we're at 68,812. Our positivity rate is down to 2.3%. That's our lowest rate since October the 17th. So we're getting back to where we were <clears throat> in the middle of the fall. We still have some roads to go. As Dr. Brown's alluded to, and you can see our data, the ICU admissions are uh, a late responder, as well as hospitalizations. So while we're down to 340, that's down from where we were in the uh, low 400s. We still have a way to go, and we have to watch that and monitor that. We are now adding to our reports on variants. As we announced, we are going to be testing all positives and run them through our special PCR screening for the 501 variant, and then doing the genomic sequencing after that. And we're purporting to try and give you the data you have on what these variants mean in general basis, province-wide, as well as specifically to some areas. So we have now confirmed 239. Our positivity, <clears throat> when we did our, as you talked about last week, with our point prevalence on the 20th of January was 1.3%. Uh, as of February the 3rd, it is 6.7%. Uh, as Dr. Brown has noted, and as Dr. Allen noted, the doubling time for the, especially the UK variant we know, is much quicker. Usually about seven to 10 days as compared to two weeks. Keep that in mind, that means today, we are probably well up to around 11 to 14%, but we'll have to be informed by the data and information. So far of our variants, 236 of the 239 are the UK, B117. Three are the South African, the B1351. We have one that we're working up with a Brazilian that we're still looking at the laboratory testing to see if it really is. And sometimes with the um, technology, we have to take a little bit more time to make sure the genomic sequencing is correct before we dedicate that to be that specific variant. <clears throat> but we're on the watch and we're noting. We noted that our VOCs are spread out with 12 health units, the ones we've genomically sequenced. We've notified a number of health units that they have a 501 and has been identified in their data, still to be sequenced. So the ones sequenced so far, most of course are, have been in, not of course, but have been noted in the Simcoe Muskoka area. And in the Simcoe Muskoka area in Barrie, it was more in the, related to the outbreak at the long-term care and retirement home, mostly in the former with 130 cases of the UK variant. 29 in Toronto, 28 in York, 23 in Peel, 11 in Durham. But they are spread over 12 health units and we'll see some more as the issue um, escalates and according to what Dr. Brown has projected in the um, uh, forecasting and modeling. So based on this, 80% um, of our variants of concern are either outbreak associated or with close contact of a confirmed case. 11% so far have known epidemiological link and 8% are travel related. Some of these ones with these links and contacts, we can only go back so far as what people can recollect. And because of the ease of transmission, it makes it even more challenging to do your case contact management. <clears throat> Before I talk about general issues, we are also like to report on our adverse events related to vaccination because people are asking that. Uh, so far um, in the data I'm reporting today of 380,000 vaccinations, as Dr. Brown's alluded to, we're well over that now. This is of the data I'm giving it to you. We have three, 287 adverse events, of which 283 are classified as non-serious, and four is more serious. And um, those are mo most of our mild ones are allergic skin reactions and local pain at the site. Of the four serious ones, we had two where we have an allergic or anaphylactic reaction. One unusual event, the details are not available, and one had to do with renal injury. And there. All, were all these ones were hospitalized but reported to be fully recovered. So where does that leave us? <clears throat> we're in a very, I know Dr. Brown didn't use it today, but he probably would have. We're in a precarious, a tenuous situation at this time. We have our numbers coming down and that's to the credit of what you've done and the hard work you've put forward. It shows you that staying at home, doing the public health measures, wearing a mask when you're out, wearing a proper mask, wearing it properly, Wearing it when you cannot maintain two meter distance, 
being careful with only contact uh, without a mask with your household members. And if you have any illness in that, to stay home or to get assessed for testing. And with that, we have opened up nearly half our schools for in-class attendance, and the rest will be opening up on Tuesday in Toronto, Peel, and York Region. <clears throat> we have already opened up, we already have moved into the framework, I should say. Um, the three health units that are in the so-called green level of the framework. And I want to address that because while the Premier and the Minister and Deputy, Minister, Deputy Premier uh, Elliott have commented that while we're going back into the framework, this is not an opening up. With the variance of concern and what Dr. Brown has shown us and warned us about is that while we can open up some aspects within the framework, we can't open up writ large. We have to be more vigilant and more careful with our personal contact, or conduct, I should say. We have found throughout this time, one of our challenges we've had is people, either by various methods, have decided that it wasn't necessary, have been a bit more casual, sometimes with close contacts with people, forgot to wear the mask, had a chat with someone for five or 10 minutes without distancing. And while you may have seen that might have got away with that with the other COVID, with the other COVID strain, this new one does not permit that. You just need a very short contact and you can transmit. People say, I just said, talk to someone for a few minutes and I don't know how I got it, but it's the only way I got it. And people are surprised at how rapidly and how easily it is transmitted. That means even if you are in some things that are more available, some of those essential services that we know are important for you, you should use them very judiciously. Still stay at home if you don't need to go out. Still make sure you limit your contacts on your household. Still wear a mask when you're out and around, a proper one. Still uh, wear it properly. Hand hygiene. If you're sick, stay home. That means very careful screening of your children before they go to school. If you have any concerns, even if they seem to be not sure about what symptoms and that, and you think they might have had contact, contact public health, and we'll try to arrange for you to get tested, your child, siblings, and the family as soon as we can, because we want to help you and help us to keep our schools open and to inform you and overcome your doubts and concerns. When we get those tests done, if there is a positive, as I said before, we'll be vetting that through our, P, our, our, our PCR system for assessing the 501 mutation on real time. Because you may say, could it be the variation? We want, we want to know and we want you to know if it is and give you some more advice and direction in that regard. So we have allowed three of the health units as of yesterday to go into the green zone and they have um, done so. Some have put in some stipulations, and I think they're good stipulations. The communities in the areas have done well to keep the rates down. When they're opening up some of their facilities, those are really for the local community, and they've asked that only the local community should access those. In a way, I applaud that kind of direction. In a way, stay at home. If you do need to go out, stay local. Don't travel around, so we're not encouraging intra-provincial travel or inter-provincial travel. We certainly don't encourage international travel, unless it's a critical issue issue, and then you're gonna to have to go through the proper systems that we've put in place. So we need to say, as we'll be announcing uh, sometime tomorrow, if there are some more people entering the framework, that just means they're in the framework. It does not mean any lifting of the personal protection. That's where most of our transmission takes place. People gathering, people in their households, people meeting, People have get-togethers. What was thought to, to do it casually, that with the new variants is no longer permissible and is going to be really hazardous and it could bring us back into a, a worse situation and into a lockdown again. So those are my overall messages. We're in a precarious time. We're trying to get our vaccine supplies back up and get our program of vaccination back up to full speed as soon as we can. We're doing the best we can. We're seeing evidence of our program with reducing deaths in the long-term care homes. It's a start, we're getting there. So that's happening, but it's not as quick as we'd like it because we have, we're delayed. We have the VOCs picking up, the variants of concern, and as Dr. Brownsville too, we may start to start really ramp up in the early part of March, especially by the middle of March. That's a tenuous time. And also we have our schools back and we are putting some back into the framework. All these are challenging, but if we do it right, if we do it carefully, if we do it with precautions, if we do a lot of testing, do a lot of assessment, just like we have before, 
I think we can win on this one too. We can keep the curve down. We can keep our schools open, our long-term care facilities safe, our retirement homes safe, and our hospital load decreased, our ICU numbers down, and more regular surgical issues that are still waiting, still need to be done, and we don't want to delay those any more than we have to. So all things have to come together in the next few weeks. So really focus, really stay tuned to this, and we'll update you as soon as we can with all the data to inform you how we are collectively doing. So with that, I'm going to open up for questions from the media. We'll go to the phone lines. Just a reminder, one question, one follow-up. Over to the first question, please. Your first question comes from Rob, Rob Ferguson from the Toronto Star. Rob, please go ahead. Hi, Doctor. Uh, just trying to parse all this. Um, we heard some kind of stern warnings from, from Dr. Brown there about what could happen with B117, and apparently 5 to 10% of cases are variants. I don't know if that means daily new cases are 5 to 10% variants or if that's overall. Maybe you could clarify that. But how do people make sense of what you're saying, that some places are going back into the framework or are already back into the framework with eased restrictions, but that we have to get the reproduction d number down. I, I don't think people can make sense of that. I'm certainly having trouble with it. Let me ask Dr. Brown to comment on you asked about the percent and the impacts of the percent of var variance, and then I'll come back and answer the one about how it applies to your second part. Great. So if, uh, if I understand your question correctly, we estimate right now probably five to seven, eight, at least when we were doing our modeling. Uh, Dr. Williams has talked about a number that's even potentially higher. What happens at this, this starts to look like a hockey stick that it curves up. And so it's, it's not a linear prog uh, progression. It will actually curve up and up and up and become a higher and higher proportion of the cases. And as it uh, becomes the dominant uh, strain, you'll see it actually start to drive total cases up. Unless you get into something like what the United Kingdom felt compelled to do uh, eventually, which is a very, very strict uh, lockdown that dropped there are, I believe, close to 0.5, although I, uh, I'm not sure. And further to your question about re-entering the framework. Remember, the framework was set up as a regional constraint. So it isn't an opening. <clears throat> and so if you're entering back in gray, you're going to see some new restrictions on there, uh, some opening up a little bit, not much. So there's not much change if you're opening to red, etc. So it's not that the doors are thrown wide open. Yes, the first three were picked because they were green. Their RE or I is very low, and uh, that is fortunate for them. And some would say they've done a good job at keeping that, and they hope to stay that way. So just because we're allowing the framework, the framework is a varied level of constraint that is going to be maintained. And as we do that weekly, if you come down, open up into a certain level, if we find the data, if you've gone up, you go back up to the next level and back up into a constraint area. There's also in the new methodology a so-called emergency break, where is if it doesn't matter what level you're in, if there's something rapidly happening, especially with variants of concern, and you need to assess that with consultation and proper system very quickly, I can recommend and we can bring that back down into a lockdown position until the assessment's done. We've done that already. North Bay was worried about, all of a sudden, they had a whole influx from having very few cases to having an outbreak of VOCs, or variants of concern, within an area. And they may have, they already have 11 or 12 that they're working on right now. That happened very rapidly. The medical officer health just consulted with me. I consulted and said, you're not going to open up into green. You're staying in lockdown. And they're trying to evaluate that situation until that's done. So we have those che checks in place and knowing that the framework is mobile so that if there is rates increasing, the colors will go back up from yellow to uh, orange to red, back into gray. And if lockdown is necessary, then it's necessary. So uh, the framework reinsertion is not a wide opening. It's just where it is at the moment. But the key thing, as I said, as Dr. Brown has said, if you do those public health measures, because it's spread from person to person, the variant, while being more easily spread, is spread by the same way. Still the distancing, still the masking, still the proper procedures. If everybody did that all the time in every correct way, even no matter what level of framework you're in, we wouldn't see 
the hockey stick approach that Dr. Brown's alluding to, we may have more percent, but if we're dealing with a smaller number, that's what we want. So if we can drop down below 1,000, even if they're 50% or the variance, if we can keep that down, I would be very satisfied with that. But can we? That's our challenge. Follow up. Okay, thanks, Doctor. I see your point on how that works theoretically, but we found time after time that when, when things relax a bit, people also seem to relax uh, their precautions and, uh, you know, start going to the neighbor's house or have a birthday party, you know, that kind of thing. And then, and then we end up with cases rising again. So how are you going to get around that? Because it just seems to be human nature and you seem to be hoping for the best when, generally speaking, unless there's big constraints, the best hasn't happened. I think you raise a good point. <clears throat> In the first wave, we had great adherence. People were very worried and concerned. When we started during the second wave, people were saying, maybe it's not such a big deal. People got complacent, and people did not adhere. We know that from the data. Right now, my read is people are saying, we're looking at the variants of concern. We're seeing on the new media, live time, what is and what has and is happening in the UK. We see it's not artifactual. It is real. It's having real impacts. And people are now saying, this is concerning. This is worrisome. And in fact, it does have higher transmission rates in younger people too, even in children. So it's not as people thought, got used to, I think, the old one and got sort of casual. We're giving you the data today. Casualness is not on because we have this new issue right in our face evolving right there. So people have to get, I guess, if they have to be, to be worried and fearful to maintain the proper procedures they need to do. And you cannot be concluding that it doesn't, won't impact me. That would be the wrong conclusion to make. Everybody has to do their part. Next question. Your next question comes from Ryan Lawley from Toronto Sun. Ryan, please go ahead. Hello. You, uh, you mentioned that many of the cases that are going into ICU are not in, from long-term care facilities or even from the 80-plus crowd. So I'm wondering what that means for our vaccination plan going forward. Obviously, I, I think we've got all but four to six homes that are fully vaccinated now across the province, with, at least with the first dose. So as the numbers uh, of doses ramp up over the next week or so, should we be looking at making sure that everyone 80 plus is vaccinated or should we be looking at different demographics of people who are uh, showing up in uh, ICU or in, in hospital admissions? What should we be doing to, to diminish hospital admissions using the vaccine program? Well, thank you. And that's why it's valuable to have the data and the analytics looking at that, because a lot of people are assuming that a lot of the long-term care ones were moving over into the hospital, and some have, of course. Um, <clears throat> and I think there's two challenges we have there. One is reduced mortality. That's the long-term care homes, and that's what Dr. Brown noted. And we're making some headway. Um, we do need those two doses into those people, because their immune systems are not as robust as younger people. And we want to make sure that they are covered. Uh, in that. The second thing is that when we're looking at the wider group, uh, we still have our priority groups in northern remote communities with First Nations, their elder population and others, who don't have readily access to the health care system. And so we want to make sure that's covered. So we've got to complete the task we have with the, um, both with the um, residents as well as with the staff at our long-term care uh, facilities. We are worried about our health care workers. We want to make sure those who do the frontline care are also covered. We also are watching the supply because that's the biggest issue. And <clears throat> in order to cover what you're asking for, and we like that, that challenge is right in front of us to say, if you're going to start doing the over 80s out in the community, you're not talking about a small number, you're talking about a lot of people. The encouraging part, as you saw from Dr. Brown's data, is that over 80 group in the community is not a huge amount, it's there. They, I think, for the most part, are being very careful. Family members are being very careful around not exposing them. So that's good news. At the same time, <clears throat> if we're going to move on that, we have about 600,000. We need a lot more vaccine. As soon as we get it, we're going to be doing it, and we're going to be looking at those different priority areas. So that's our challenge. It's a very 
careful moving through, dealing with these different priority ones in, in the best order, getting them done, moving to the next one, ensuring we have the best quality and according to the plan and priorities that we laid out. So we have been paused. This coming week, we're going to start getting more Pfizer. We're not sure when the Moderna is going to pick up. And we're still waiting to see if other vaccines are going to be approved from Health Canada, such as the AstraZeneca products. So there's a lot of things at play here. And uh, we would like to uh, start to address those issues as well. But priorities first, we're going to address it and get it to it as quick as we can. The faster we have the vaccine, you see lots of uh, mask clinics being set up. We're ready to roll. We need the vaccine. Dr. Brown would like to make some comments. So, yeah, so I, I think it's, it's really an issue of vaccinating where you're going to see the biggest payoff. Uh, and that means vaccinating people who are vulnerable, that's older adults. Uh, it means vaccinating those communities that are hardest hit by the pandemic. Uh, and we can actually look at that on almost a, uh, not quite a post of COVID, almost a post of COVID by post of COVID level. And it means, as Dr. Williams has said, uh, dealing with those settings that are very vulnerable, whether they be shelters or retirement homes, and those communities like our First Nations communities that may not have ready access to the healthcare system in, in the same way that uh, you know, uh, a number of other places would. So I th yeah, it really is going where you, you'll have the biggest impact. Follow up. So, you know, if we look at um, over the last few months where there have been hot spots, where we're talking healthcare workers in PSWs in Scarborough, we're talking warehouse workers and, and meatpacking uh, plant workers in Peel, we're talking farm workers in Windsor, Essex. At some point, do you have to say, uh, yes, we want to vaccinate everyone over 80 plus, which is only 600,000, and the fact that we can't vaccinate 600,000 people easily is, you know, well, that, that, that's a supply issue and, and ridiculous. But do we have to at some point say, we want go into the areas where we keep seeing spread, where we keep seeing people ending up in ICUs? So <clears throat> I think you've raised a very good point, and that's the issue we're trying to say here. Our main issue right now is our public health measures. And what we're trying to do in those settings you're noting, like today, the first day we have had, even with the usual one staff case, sometimes we see no breaks in long-term care homes reported. We've seen the impact of the deaths coming down. We're working on that. The ones you're talking about, because you're talking about workplaces, those ones have full capability of preventing those outbreaks. We want testing. We're moving in more testing to those workplaces. We want to make sure that strict adherence to occupational health and safety, including having staff um, wearing proper PPE and protection, distancing, staying home if you're ill, and there were other ways to try and assist that. Our high-risk communities <clears throat> we are rolling out a program to work with those communities to try and be stringently carried out in that. And then we're having some workers getting infected in their home and community setting. How do we stop that? With our public health measures, of course. And with uh, ramping up our testing, our screening, and so we continue to look at many different venues to do that. While we wait and get ready for the vaccine to come and get all our systems in place that when it comes, we can step up and deliver it really quickly to the right ones, even with sub-categorization, as Dr. Brown has alluded to, so we make the best impact when we get it. So those are important points to keep in mind. Next question. Your next question comes from John McGrath from TVO. John, please go ahead. Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, I confess, uh, Dr. Brown, I'm, I'm a bit confused by this presentation. Uh, you say that uh, sticking with the stay-home order will help, but the stay-at-home order is, is ending almost everywhere in Ontario on Tuesday. Uh, you say that RT needs to be below 0 0.7, and we have never actually achieved that, and we're about to Re, you know, if not reopen, we're going to reduce a lot of the public health measures. And those public health measures, as you say, uh, as they are lifted, cases could rise dramatically. Uh, am I missing something here, or is this presentation actually predicting a disaster? No, I, I don't think you're missing anything. Uh, the cases will likely rise, given the variance of concern. Uh, the need to keep that R down is really, really critical. Uh, but there are a number of things that need to be weighed in making these decisions. Uh, for Dr. Williams, uh, we have uh, moved the March break to mid-April now, but uh, we have these projections showing that cases could already be rebounding uh, very substantially by end of March, early April. 
I, I, I'm just trying to figure out how, how does that make sense if, if we move the March break to a time when uh, the models suggest that infections could be uh, on the rise. Uh, I think if you look at the data that Dr. Brown has showed you, <clears throat> is that we're going to see the upswing, if it's going to occur, if our measures have been effective, in the early part of March. Um, by April, it's already taken effect. So we really didn't want to have that, because uh, we saw a large increase in infection rates among the youth when they're out of school. Um, we didn't want that coming consistent in the public health measure table at the same time as when we saw the modeling, when the the curve in the hockey stick is really starting to pick up uh, in there. And of course, a lot of people in the March break mentality are thinking of traveling. Uh, I hope not, but I think they were thinking of going somewhere out of the country. That was not what we're recommending at all. Of course, we're saying don't. And that's part of why we have a stay-at-home order. We may be stopping the stay-at-home order, but we still want people to stay at home. And we hope that by the behavior they learned over the last while, and they can see the fruit of that, the benefit of that, that we brought down the numbers. So it's not artifactual, it does work. So keep doing that. But if you have the need to go to some of, of some facility that now is available, do so only when you need to. Do so rarely, do so with proper protection and distancing, all things in place. That's the key. And so while this is a projection, I wouldn't say it's a projection of disaster, it says, it's a, it tells you that by doing A, B, or C, you could end up with consequences. And by staying the course, there still is a good scenario there. That's why we do the modeling, to say, the public want to say, what does that mean for us? Why should we stay the course? Why should we keep it this? I can't, we can't be any clearer on that, uh, in that. Last question. Last question comes from Jessica Smith from Queen's Park Briefing. Jessica, please go ahead. Uh, hi, thanks. I'd just like to follow up on, on John McGrath's excellent uh, question. So, Dr. Williams, are you recommending that the pro province do anything else to ensure the old variant R goes down to 0.7, or are we really just letting this happen? Um, right now, our, our effective is around 8.81, sorry. A uh, number of the health units, the ones that have opened, are down about 0 0.5, 6, 0 0.4. Um, <clears throat> in there, and uh, we are anticipating with our numbers right now we may be dropping below 0.8. Um, so we're going in the right direction. Would I like it already down at 0.7? I sure would. Um, I think we can get there uh, in this, and that's the whole point. Once we get the numbers down and keep our testing uh, with our screen different methods we're doing and stay down, even the percent of variance making up those small numbers accrues as we hear it might, that is workable. It's when it starts to then start to double up and the RE goes from 0.7 to 0.9, as you saw in the graphs, then we have a problem. So what we're seeing at this time as we enter the framework with the tenuousness of it, we're going to watch that, but we could ramp that big up right back up again if the numbers show it's increasing. So it's uh, one being monitored very carefully. We know there's a lot of pressure of people are wanting to, um, are suffering economically and personally because of the situation. So it's a fine balance between, as I say, it's the comparison about in, in a medical model, if you do the population, it's like someone's had a major event and you put them on bed rest. That's safe, but after a while, if you leave them too long in the bed, other things can happen. But if you don't jump out of the bed, you could, re, you could ask for another reoccurrence of the event. So you have to be very careful what you mean by starting to mobilize a bit and move a bit with all the precautions in place. So we're not opening up, we're allowing some things to be available, but we want even more personal adherence to the stay at home, to the masking, to limiting your household contacts. All that has to be really carefully done in the next number of weeks if we're gonna get that R not, RE down to close to 0 0.7. Follow up, and this is the last question. Thanks. This is to, to Dr. Brown. Um, is the reopening of schools expected to have an impact on, on the R, and does the province need to do anything to compensate for any increase? Sure. So I, I think the important thing to keep in mind here, it's, it's a really important question. Schools tend to amplify what's in the community. So if you've got broad community spread, you'll see that the schools will amplify that. 
uh, if you want to keep your R down, if you want to prevent the spread of the variant, it means, and you want to keep schools open, which is a very, very important goal, it means you really need to control the spread in the community as much as you can. Thanks, everyone.